it's very interesting because I, I just listening to the first couple talks I, I find uh, each institution is very different in, in how uh, maybe patients neurosurgeons are seen or pa patients of care are seen by the neurosurgeons and how the referral patterns are done I'll, I'll just tell you how, how it's done at Iowa um, and uh, I'll have to give credit to my mentor, uh, Arnold, Arnold Manesis, who's been kind of a pioneer in, in Chiari and basically treating patients in Iowa with Chiari malformation for uh, 40 years. Um, and so uh, anyone with a, any kind of tonsil herniation more than five millimeters or even a radio, radiographic uh, interpretation of low-lying tonsils gets, basically gets sent to the University of Iowa. Um, so we see tons of patients in our clinic every week, probably 15 or 20 patients with, with Chiari malformation or tonsil ectopia. And we go through these, and we see we are both pediatric adult, adult uh, Chiari surgeons and CBJ surgeons, so we see all of them. Um, and uh, currently, uh, we see all patients um, either together. Um, we operate together on all, all these cases. Uh, we're both very interested from a research standpoint, clinical standpoint, in treating these patients. Um, uh, so uh, kind of a th that's the way our practice is run. I'm, I'm sure it's different everywhere else, but we don't have a, a clinic that, that, that weeds out patients. Um, we, we, we do them all. We do our own exams. We see all these patients, and we determine um, kind of how we go about surgically treating them, following them, um, so forth. All right, I have no disclosures. Um, so uh, I've been interested in kind of really what causes carry malformation, what causes uh, syrinx. Obviously, there's a lot of people in this room that have been kind of pioneers in that work, um, including, including Dr. Heiss. Uh, but and as I've gone through all these patients that we treat and see, and even during my residency at Iowa, I, I found all these things that I found, found qu quite interesting that I didn't see was in the literature. So, so some of the data I'm, putting to, I'm going to show you today have been already published, and some of the data I'm going to show you is just data that we just recently accrued and, and we'll be um, publishing and submitting at least soon in a, in a study. So. Um, I find that with most conditions, right, we treat it based on the etiology. I mean, the, the best example is an infection, right? You try to figure out what that bacteria is and you treat it. Well, interesting with Chiari, we've kind of skipped that point. You know, we found out that posterior fossil decompression works really well, and so that's been applied to everything, but we don't really know what we're doing exactly and what really causes the tonsil herniation and, and the syrinx associated with it. Um, so, you know, why study it? Well, the results aren't great, right? Um, we have widely varying results kind of across the world in patients, p pediatric and adult, um, with, with surgery. Um, I think understanding Chiari will help better, better understand the symptoms, basically cause and effect, um, and better, better individualize treatment strategies, which I think is the biggest point. Obviously, we can do a posterior fossa decompression. We can do the maximal type of surgery, and, and patients will probably do well. Uh, but trying to individualize the treatment strategy, whether they need this big of a surgery or this small of a surgery that can be followed, I think will be beneficial in the long term. So last year we published multiple papers on this topic, um, and I'll discuss a couple of those. Uh, so um, what causes a carry malformation? Well, lots of data suggests it's a decrease in posterior fossa volume, right? The idea that this is a um, crowded area and volume, and then there's not enough the neural tissue, either maybe it's a little bit larger or the same size as normal population, but it doesn't have enough room to fit back here. So the tonsils then herniate over um, and descend below the frame and magnum. Um, and in some cases, which I'll talk about, will cause what we describe as the cervical medullary buckle, right, which is the descent of the medulla down into the spinal canal and can cause significant brainstem dysfunction and so forth. Um, this is a pediatric patient. We see the same thing very much so in an adult patient, okay? Um, there's really not much CSF space at all in this area, and it's crowded, and, and if you, volumetrically, the, these are smaller than the normal population. However, in some cases, uh, I, I took this from a paper from, uh, from Virginia and Dr. Oldfield's, one of his last papers, showing that there's plenty of CSF that occurs around the cerebellum. So it's not totally just a crowded area. How come the, the cerebellum can't just fill, fill some of this entire space and not have the tonsils herniate below? Um, and we see tons of patients like that in our clinic. So there must be something else involved. Um, the other question that we've had is, you know, what is this difference between a carry one without a syrinx and with a syrinx, right? This has been discussed a little bit. Um, Dr. Sandberg mentioned this, that you have this same kind of image, same kind of radiographic image. Um, one patient has a syrinx, so a patient has no syrinx. So what's the difference in, in these patients? Um, there's got to be something more than just that posterior fossa volume, which in this case, they're both identical. So what else could be contributing? 
um, to cause an EQRA malformation, tonsil herniation, and, and associated syringomyelia. Um, well, many studies have examined extradural pathology. When I talk about extradural pathology, the bony osseous abnormalities that can cause a decrease in that posterior fossa volume. And only a few studies really examine this intradural pathology. Um, so Dr. Oaks in Alabama described the arachnoid veil. Dr. Amnesia described this arachnoid veil as well in 2004, um, but really hasn't been a systematic um, analysis of this pathology that occurs inside and around the cerebellum and the frame of magnum um, and the outlet of the fourth ventricle in the patients with Chiari. So we had this hypothesis that really intradural pathology plays a role in the cause of Chiari, tonsil herniation, and, and Chiari 1 associated stringomyelia beyond just a smaller posterior fossa volume. So it was a methods prospective study um, done starting in March 2003 to 2016 um, and recorded all these intradural pathological entities. Um, observed which pathologic entity obstructed CSF flow channels, and then um, uh, looked at incidents across age, degree of tonsil herniation, and then with or without syrinx. And this is statistical analysis using univariate and then multivariate analysis. Um, so, uh, you know, some of the positives about this is that, we, that Dr. Mises and I, we see all the patients at the University of Iowa. So it's, it's a two surgeon approach. Um, we both do surgery um, identically. Um, we both observed all this. I learned basically everything from him in terms of surgery-wise. Um, so this is our cohort at the University of Iowa. Um, so 389 patients from March 2003 to 2016, 379 patients. Um, so a couple of these patients had obviously two surgeries. Um, we do a variety of different approaches to this uh, to treat Chiari because they have different types of pathology. Um, and the ones we're looking at here are just these first time posterior fossa, but a combination of extradural decompression, which is the bony decompression people talk about, and then this intradural decompression and duroplasty. Um, so we describe this intradural decompression as opening up the intradural pathology and the adhesions that we see there. Um, and then duroplasty um, is actually expanding somewhat the, uh, the dura around the posterior fossa to allow a little bit more room uh, and easier closure. So 109 surgery, 109 patients. Um, we described our technique in, in uh, a recent publication. Um, uh, we just do a linear, this is our decompression here from basically the inferior nuchal, oh, sorry, from the uh, um, uh, yeah, inferior nuchal line down to um, just the superior aspect of C1. That's our bony decompression. We don't usually take off all of C1. We just do superior two thirds C1 laminectomy. We like to leave some bone uh, to allow muscle to attach for stability. Uh, so that's why we leave a little bit of this. Um, we open up in this linear fashion. Uh, just easier to do that rather than doing some Y-shaped large opening. Um, we don't need to really do more than this. You get to both tonsils by just doing a linear incision. You avoid any kind of vasculature here across the occipital sinus as well. Um, open up, do our intradural decompression, open up the frame of Magindi, um, and then do our duroplasty. So th that's the technique. While we're doing the intradural de decompression, um, we are defining what we see there. And that's all recorded both in our prospective database and then obviously in the operative chart. So um, what do we see? So there's a lot of pathology that's really not obstructive that we see that's abnormal, okay? So this is a great example that you can see that you never would see this in a patient with any kind of posterior fossa tumor, right? They have very clear, clear arachnoid. Um, this is arachnoid opacification. So um, in this case, almost completely opaque. And here, uh, somewhat semi-translucent, and, and it spans a spectrum from, com basically in some patients it's clear, arachnoid to other patients, which this is kind of the extreme, you can't see anything. Um, and it's thick, in some cases thick in, sometimes it has calcifications within it, sometimes it has strands within it that are kind of unknown to us at this point. Um, one third of all patients seem to have this. Um, so ischemic and gliotic tonsils. So this is that scarring that occurs in the tonsils from the tonsil descent. Um, because they're uh, compacted into that, the, um, the spinal canal. Dr. Batsdorf mentioned, that's why he probably was interested in looking at the width of the, that canal, because obviously the smaller the canal, the more compression the tonsils are gonna have, both on the spinal cord within, and then onto the brainstem, and then the more likely they're gonna become gliotic and scarred, um, and that's what you see here. That's what white, that's not bipolar you know, tonsils, this is gliotic, scarred tonsils. You can see some adhesions, interactive adhesions, which I'll show later. Another example. Um, but you wonder how much this has an effect actually on the brain itself, on the cerebellum. Does, have a, does this part of the brain have any kind of functional effect? We don't know. Um, and something actually we're kind of actively looking at. Some patients have tonsor cysts. So one patient actually in, our, in this series had a tonsor cyst. Um, we believe, and this has been reported on before in a smaller series. 
Um, but uh, thought to be occurred from that gliotic and scarred tonsil that then forms um, fluid within an inflammation um, and eventually this cyst. But you can see here, this is the um, Chiari malformation, the tonsils herniate down. There's a cervical med medullary buckle that's there, so the, uh, the medulla has been uh, pushed down by the tonsils and the Chiari. There's this white that's here. That's not CSF. That's actually this cyst. You can see how much compression that's putting on this at the at junction of the, cerv the cervical medullary junction. Um, pretty significant, right? Um, and actually, not can't really see here, but this is actually rotating the entire um, cervical medullary junction over to this side. Um, so that's decompressed and, and, and resected. So many of these patients, we notice the level of the frame of the magnum, which is right here. This is the level of that the occipital cervical um, epidural compressive band. Uh, the fourth ventricle is below that level, right? So we know that the fourth ventricle and therefore the, the medulla obviously descended below this line. Um, this is actually the, the gracile nucleus right down here, and that's how far the, the, the brainstem has been herniated. Um, so, and that was seen in 78% uh, of the, the patients. So what, what kind of pathology do we see that appeared to obstruct CSF flow? Well, um, medialized tonsils almost in every case, 100% of patients. Um, they're not separated, they're coming to midline um, and obviously below the frame of magnum. Um, so in that case, they're very symmetric, but in 20% of the cases, one of those tonsils is much more, is much more asymmetric, larger, appears to herniate more. You can see this is the right tonsil here filling basically the entire dorsal aspect of our exposure and basically covering the frame of magendi. We believe in these cases, the patients maybe have more likely have less of a CSF flow out of the frame of, of Magendi because you have one tonsil really occluding that. And then we have one patient in which actually this, one of these tonsils actually filled the entire fourth ventricle and dilated it and increased it. And um, we had to pull the fourth ventricle, uh, pull the tonsil out of that fourth ventricle then to actually achieve a good decompression. Um, Usually these intertonsil and tonsil to brainstem cervical medullary junction adhesion. So they can be thick in this case. They can be thin and strand-like, but they appear to be holding the tonsils down and inferiorly, preventing probably you know, a rise of the, of the tonsils um, and movement. And, 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 and you can see here after decompression, this is where the, the fourth ventricle is, how much higher that is and, and how, how high up it is. This occurs in 85% of patients. And then in some cases, about 40% of patients, the opening of the frame of Magindi, which is seen here, you have a veil as well, which I'll talk about in the next slide, but you have these two vermian pica branches that are going in there, and appears also to obstruct the flow out of the frame of Magindi. Um, so uh, these kind of aberrant vessels, um, we treat that by kind of cauterizing the tonsils, opening up this, these adhesions, and then by cauterizing the, the tonsils out, it'll pull these vessels away from the opening of the frame of and allow better flow. So um, the arachnoid veil, which has been described before by Arnold Manesis and Jerry Oakes, uh, we looked at and we found a much larger percentage in our patients in this prospective study. So 60% of patients. Doesn't mean there was a complete veil in these cases, and we described it in very different in different ways. So, a very com there's a complete perforated inferior two-thirds, inferior one-third types of veils. Overall, with taking all of those, patients with a syrinx, 60% of patients had that. Without a syrinx, one-third. Um, this is a six-year-old uh, girl with carry malformation and syringomyelia, obviously very large syrinx. Um, and this is her uh, intradural pathology. Um, she didn't have that many adhesions. She had these, they had these symmetric medialized tonsils. But opening up, you see this almost complete veil. Um, and here's the kind of you know, steps that we kind of take to open this up. And you can see this glisten of CSF that's there. And um, this is kind of a video just kind of illustrating kind of the CSF kind of almost being held back by this. And once you open this up, you can see the CSF flowing very well now through, through the frame. Um, you can see how much more CSF is here. We open this up kind of a stepwise fashion and, and using bipolar and scissors, micro scissors obviously underneath the microscope. Um, we use a microscope for all these cases. I think it helps define the intradural pathology. You can see the CSF now flowing much better okay, than before, which you really couldn't see. So again, we did univariate multivariate statistical analysis for, for, for the study. Uh, we found that tonsil herniation was associated with a greater descent of the cervical medullary junction. And then that 
oftentimes with that descent of the cervical medullary junction, you can see it radiographically. Such a heist is trying to discuss what can we find radiographically that's important right, to treat patients well. A lot of patients you see the cervical medullary buckle, which is down here, um, and that's also correlated with this descent. Uh, sorry, correlated. The descent of the uh, cervical medullary junction correlated with that, with that descent of the buckle, basically confirming that what we see here radiographically is the medulla. Okay. So um, we found that arachnoid veils are more common in patients with Chiari with syrinx. Um, so arachnoid veils were 3.22 time, 2, times the odds of being associated with, with syringomyelia with a p-value of uh, 0.013. So interestingly, the question uh, that we had was, is this something that's acquired, right? Are these all this pathology that we see, something that occurs over time, the, the pulsations of the tonsils down around the cervical medullary junction, uh, the adhesions, the veil, and so on. But we did not see a statistical difference across age. So this is something that's intrinsic to the condition um, and not something that's acquired. I think that's important because that basically illustrates that this is something that's a part of Chiari malformation. Um, it may, as we just thought in our hypothesis, may be really the cause of the herniation in the syrinx. So um, some patients have a, a syringobulbia. That's actually a syrinx that goes into the brain stem. You can see here. Um, this is the syrinx here. Syrinx goes up and in the brain stem. And in, in one case, obviously quite severe, we, it goes up into the pons, midbrain, thalamus, even into the... Uh, the brain itself. Um, oh, sorry. Nine of these, we have 13 patients. So these are actually pediatric patients. We have more adult patients. We haven't published that yet, but 13 patients overall. Nine of those patients found to have arachnoid veil. These patients have the most severe intradural pathology that you will see scarring, adhesions, and so forth. Almost all, all these patients sh should have an intradural procedure. So, conclusions and clinical implications. Well, this intradural pathology is associated with. Chiari malformation is existing in many forms um, and probably uh, uh, not as recognized as, as um, previously um, stated. Uh, Rachnoid veils, the obstruct CSF flow, significantly more common in patients with syrinx and may play a role in Chiari 1 associated syringomyelia. So we, should, we still say that opening the dura and ensuring outflow from the frame of Majindi may lead to better outcomes in patients with, with syrinx and Chiari. So this is new data. Um, and it's not been published yet, but we submitted it, so I felt comfortable uh, showing that here and sharing it. I think it's interesting um, that we something that we have observed in all our patients. So, four ventricle volume and Chiari malformation, and this is Ann Osborne's classic neurodiagnostic textbook on Chiari malformation, states that the four ventricle is small but normally located. Um, and that's the idea behind this crowded hypothesis, right? That you just have crowding in the posterior fossa and the fourth ventricle is small. Yet, how many times do we see patients when the fourth ventricle is much, much larger than it is, than it should be? It's not. So we, we looked at this in all our patients using volumetrical analysis of the fourth ventricle. Um, and it's enlarged in patients with Chiari malformation. So uh, we took normal controls, the age matched them, gender matched to normal controls. This is here, so fourth ventricle volume in patients normal is around here. Chiari malformation, the fourth ventricle, is much higher. And you can see there's a variation, of course, and there's no doubt there's going to be that because it you know, it's a heterogeneous condition. Um, interestingly, you would think, okay, the larger fourth ventricle is a hydrocephalus. No, actually, the lateral ventricle volume actually is smaller in patients with Chiari malformation in this study uh, compared to patients with normal population. And this is 70 patients, so it's not a small number. Um, you can see here, look how large this fourth ventricle is. You can almost imagine if this was normal size that the tonsils probably wouldn't be down in this, they would probably fill some of this space. Um, just suggesting again that maybe the cause of this tonsil herniation is more intradural pathology in a, in a veil, pushing the tonsils down rather than just a smaller posterior fossa. You can see a CSF behind here. So it's not this crowded idea, not that crowded hypothesis, not every case at least. Um, there's a huge variation in these patients. Pediatric, this is a pediatric cohort of what the fourth ventricle looks. Yeah, it can be small, as Dr. Osborne has stated in her textbook, but you can see how much bigger it can get in some patients. Um, and this correlates with tonsil herniation. And this is adults, same kind, of, same kind of idea. You can see how much it herniates here and how big the fourth ventricle is. And you can see this kind of gradation. Um, interestingly, in some patients, if we do de do decompression, uh, the fourth ventricle will get smaller. Um, not every patient. Um, so we're still looking at that. Uh, 
I think this all brings in the idea of, you know, what's going on in the cerebellum and what kind of effects that may have actually on the brain itself, uh, which is interesting. So acknowledgments. Um, as I said before, Arnold Manis has been a mentor of mine. This is also one of our colleagues in pediatric neurosurgery, uh, Saul Wilson. And I'm very interested in the cerebellum, how it functions and correlates with the brain. Um, and so I have multiple people that I work with studying this. This is one of the residents who did all the work um, on the uh, volumetric analysis, uh, Scott Seaman, and then uh, uh, Dan Trinell is a neuropsychologist who's working with us. Um, and, and Janita Cam is also a neuropsychologist. And John Lemmy, who's also been very interested in the cerebellum and psychiatric, psychiatric conditions. So thank you. Thank you.